Good afternoon. I'm Mark Allen with Gaper.io, and I'm here today with Evan Young, the CEO of Rad3D. Good afternoon, Evan. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me, Mark. Thanks for joining us today. So can you share a brief background of yourself and your work experience? Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit about me. Uh, I am a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I've spent the last five years or so in the VR and AR industry, and it's definitely been a, a wild ride. I've seen come with some, some of the, the uh, ups and the downs of it. And I uh, just say, you know, so happy to be here and happy to keep moving the industry forward. No, and uh, a little bit about where I'm, you know, I'm originally from Hawaii. Uh, I've, you know, lived in several of the tech hubs, being in Silicon Valley, being in Denver, and also been in LA as well. Hmm. So all pretty much a West Coast person and east of the Miss or west of the Mississippi person. <laughs> right, right. So what has been your experience with remote employment, both as a remote employee and a remote employer? Yeah, yeah, it's funny um, that everything's been shifting towards remote work lately because I mentioned this earlier, Mark, that I've spent the majority of my career working remote. Um, never actually had a physical office or a cubicle or anything. Uh, my, my backpack is literally a, um, a monitor that weighs about a pound <laughs> that I can carry <laughs> with me everywhere. Um, that monitor has been with me to many countries and many check-ins <laughs> Mm -hmm. and things like that um so yeah i'm used to working at coffee shops um, out of other people's offices uh wherever i can find decent wi-fi essentially so that's my experience um typically and that's mainly been uh for one for flexibility and two just for cost for one i mean mm -hmm. um you know being in the bay area as you probably know office space can cost you an arm and a leg easily <laughs> yeah and um for the early stages of a company you may or may not even even need it unless if you're happy to welcome clients from Fortune 500 companies where you have to kind of put on a good, a good pony show essentially when yes. they come in to see your office. But as a startup, um, you know, you probably don't have that, that luxury of having Fortune 500 CEOs walk through your, walk through your doors. <laughs> Not generally, yeah, unless your product is really special. Right, right. And as are they're trying to buy you anyway. <laughs> right, you yeah, <laughs> right. So that's, yeah, that's another story. But yeah. Um, for, for employees, yeah, we, we've hired um, several different um, remote employees through um, tons of different channels. We've, we've, used, we've used AngelList, uh, we've used things like freelancing websites and things like that as well. And yeah, well, actually one of our first betas uh, was uh, for, not, for not this current company that I'm working for now, but for my first company, um, a lot of it was built with a remote developer out of Belarus actually and before we hired him i actually didn't even know where belarus was <laughs> wow. but it would turn out to be a great experience he was a very talented engineer um easily could have been a rock star candidate at you know some of the top five tech companies in the bay area if he were to get his visa and come here and like i told him that every single day mm -hmm. <laughs> so i was definitely very very grateful to have him as a, as a core part of our team no i i, I mean the majority of our developers are from that part of the world and they are very, very talented. Yeah, agreed. I agree. And, and I personally, I don't think I could uh, point out Belarus on a map. I, I know the general <laughs> area where it is, but I don't, you know, I would, is it that one or is it that? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> we actually, the only time I actually ever pulled up his physical address is when we actually had to ship him um, some VR hardware. Mm. And this, this was back in the day where VR hardware wasn't so easy to get. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you could only receive it in certain countries. <laughs> oh, wow. So that's when it became a point where I was like, okay, he actually has to physically receive this package. <laughs> but other than that, we had no idea where, you know, what his physical address actually was because we didn't, we didn't have to. <laughs> wow. That's interesting. And, and you mentioned something kind of interesting. Maybe you give us a, some advice here. Since you look for hotspots all over the place, like I personally, when I travel, if I need a hotspot, I'll either go to a hotel or a Starbucks. Do you right. do you have any that you notice have better coverage than others? Mm, yeah, coffee shops are are probably like the the, the go to. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I mean, I've, I've I mean nowadays it's been it's been definitely easier because most shopping malls, at least like the nicer ones, at least have Wi Fi everywhere. Um, even the ones that are even kind of like a little more like like industrial looking, mm -hmm. I guess, are pretty good. Like I've popped into. Um, you know, just like nicer restaurants that have mm -hmm. Wi-Fi are pretty good. Um, I've also just done like some um, some gyms or some fitness clubs as well. 
Yeah, excellent. Um, I, I'm a proud member of 24 Hour Fitness, which is great. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of 24 Hour Fitness across California. Yeah, and, <laughs> as you probably they know. They have Wi-Fi, uh, I assume? Yeah, they have Wi-Fi and they have a shower and they have a locker. So it's it's funny. It's it's basically like a you know a makeshift co-working space uh, if you can't afford those. I mean, it's and and you get the shower too. Most co-working spaces don't have showers. Yes. <laughs> so it's um yeah it's kind of a uh, my on the go office sometimes. It's twenty four hour fitness and it's always open. I mean, <laughs> except for That's now, of course, the pandemic. But yeah, yeah you I typically see. it's twenty four hour access to Wi Fi and a shower, which is a good thing to have. <laughs> yes, it is. Actually, my gym is also closed. I, I'm a member of the uh, Jewish Community Center uh, <laughs> in Foster City. Um, they're closed now, but I do. I have used their um, Wi-Fi from time to time, too. <laughs> yes, and I do shower there, too, but that's after I, t I work out. So. <laughs> right, right. But yeah, that's, a, that's definitely a good second, uh, second location if you can't find a Starbucks near you. <laughs> yeah, this is true. So, what do you think is the future of remote employment and what do you think can be done differently to make it more effective? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, due to the current environment we're in now, uh, I think a lot of people are just finding out that, you know, remote work isn't that easy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's people, it's kind of like an unfound, uh, untapped skill, I guess that people like me who have, you know, have been doing this my entire career, all of a sudden it's like, re like remote working is like a new skill you can put on your, on, on, mm -hmm. on your on your resume that you couldn't <laughs> couldn't do before potentially <laughs> true um but i mean i you know, me and probably a bunch of other people who have been startups or it's been in the tech world for so long we just do it naturally we're you know we're used to taking online meetings um just because of travel or just because of efficiency mm -hmm. um that now it's like kind of like this skill where people are asking us like hey can you give a webinar about remote work and for us it's like so logical <laughs> i know <laughs> we've been doing this for such a long time but now it's like, oh, it's just like this new sought out skill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think it's, um, that's interesting for one, but it's also um, kind of a, a shift in older or more traditional companies that are more, um, you know, every day, you know, they see their customers, they have clients come in the office, it's a very traditional type of business uh, where they're trying to scale this out in, in, in this new environment. Mm -hmm. So I definitely think that it's not only a temporary shift but i think there's definitely a lot of learnings here that can be permanent where you know six months to a year from now when everything is ideally back to normal quote unquote <laughs> people mm -hmm. will will look back at their you know their current year and look back at what they've what they've spent on you know traditional costs and maybe even you know traditional you know employees of so, you know people being at the front desk or kind of being like that face and kind of realizing that hey you know i don't i'm gonna actually have to have that cost um, mm -hmm. I can do all of these things, from, you know, online, whether we're in a pandemic or not, and maybe it gives uh, a more level of uh, higher robustness to my company, but also just from a cost perspective, it can save me a lot of money, uh, which I don't think, I mean, that's probably been the pitch for, you know, remote work for years and years, <laughs> but yes. now um, these larger companies who are probably never, it never, probably never clicked in their minds of why they would ever go remote. Um, they're probably seeing the cost benefits of it and just the the realization of like hey this is actually a solid model <laughs> yeah and and i mean i've been working remotely for 10 years now so i i'm the thing i've noticed uh is uh the well, in general the quality of life i think since covid i've noticed the difference in the traffic in the bay area it's been huge even, even before yeah. covid when when google facebook and apple told all of their employees to work from home it was a noticeable difference in the traffic in the Bay Area for a week, yeah. and then we all went to shut down. So then it didn't matter where you could go because there was no nowhere to go. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. <laughs> yes. So, what is the story behind Rad Three D? Um, what is your product line, and who do you service, and all those things? And what's the journey been like? Yeah, yeah. So Rad Three D, in short, is software uh, that trains healthcare workers using augmented reality. Mm -hmm. And we started it um, out of the University of Hawaii uh, Medical School. And we've uh, we put on workshops and a um, bunch of other type of curriculum based programs for many, many years with Dr. Scott Lozanoff, our co-founder. And one of the biggest problems that he ran into is that, it also kind of was mind boggling as well, is that people from all over the world, uh, you know, from Japan, from China, uh, you know, from New York, even, you know, would fly, you know, easily 10 plus hours <laughs> to mm -hmm. get to his lab in Hawaii. 
um, just for one workshop. And that workshop was very much, you know, one-time experience where they would come in, uh, you know, they would pay for equipment. There was a bunch of setup costs that was very expensive. And once they walk out that door, that knowledge, um, that valuable information, the SAMC walked out the door with them. Hmm. And then we kept kicking it around where, you know, we wish, you know, one, it was cheaper, of course. And two, it didn't take away these valuable time from these clinicians out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. And augmented reality um, provided kind of a new medium in order for us to do that, that um, gained the same value of, you know, being in the same room together, being able to experience equipment and experience things like medical imaging together in the same room and collaborate, but also be able to, you know, not travel and also just save a ton of money as well. So that's kind of the, the two big factors of, of RAD 3D that we set out to accomplish. Uh, right now we're working specifically with surgeons, uh, with planning, as well as residency programs and training clinicians as well. Hmm. So you, for, for lack of a better term, you're, you're remote training for um, hospitals, right? Right, yeah, that's actually, yeah, that's, uh, you actually kind of hit it right on the head there where, um, you know, VR and AR was, you know, a lot of people think of it as this, you know, tied to device, you know, where you're tied to a laptop or some heavy, heavy hardware computer. And, you know, the biggest innovation probably in VR era in the past five years is that it's now essentially a remote device. Um, mm -hmm. And what was exciting even more is that there are you know, big players behind this, like, you know, like Apple, who essentially, you know, and, and I'm, I don't work for Apple, but I would assume <laughs> that their goal is to make this like the new iPhone, where it's kind of the next generation of personal devices, where, you know, the cost, hardware, cost of hardware is coming down, um, you know, the speed of internet and the, you know, the things all we need to, get, to have good VR and good AR are becoming more modernized. Essentially, you can have, you know, an incredible augmented or virtual reality experience um, from anywhere, mm -hmm. which is really totally re re revolutionizes, you know, remote work where the main remote work device is, you know, your laptop and your phone, which we are on, on now. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of these bigger companies like Apple and, you know, of course, the bigger ones as well are, are looking at VR and AR as this future of remote work. Mm, very possible, yes. So it sounds like you started your company out as a remote employment company. So, I mean, you yourself are proof of that, right? Yeah, yeah. Is, is, um, there, is there anything you had to do at startup time to instill that or did it just kind of happen naturally? A lot of it was naturally, uh, and I think it was because of our backgrounds typically. So we knew going forward um, that we were probably going to be a remote company, uh, <laughs> just because of, of the nature of it. Of the, you know, we're most of us are highly technical. We're used to working on things like Slack and things like Zoom, um, or even in VR <laughs> as well. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, most of us, I actually, a bunch of us actually first met um, on Slack. Actually, hmm. we're in a giant um, hacker space that the uh, the online community is on Slack, and it's uh, basically a group of 100 to 200 uh, either developers or people that work in maker spaces or people that are community builders and things like that. Um, so that's actually how we, yeah, I, that's how I met my founding team essentially was online. <laughs> so it really? kind of was ingrained from the start <laughs> that hmm. we were going to be a remote online based company um and it just kind of so happened that the the uh the characteristics i guess of our team was you know we didn't you know we didn't like driving in traffic mm -hmm. um you know we didn't like um a lot of you know type of we we didn't need that that face-to-face -face kind of stand-up meeting type of structure in, in our company in order to be successful whereas some other people might need that uh, or you right. are more used to that type of structure in order to be successful for us um, we were just used to it from the start. Yeah, true. And, and, and I noticed too, I mean, developers in general don't need that to be in the office as much as, because once they get focused on something, they actually don't like to be disturbed. Right, right. Yeah, it's funny that you say that because in one of our, in one of our meetings with one of our advisors, uh, he was like, he asked a typical advisor question of how can I be most helpful? <laughs> and my CTO was sitting there and he's like bluntly said, honestly, the most thing you can do is just, leave me alone and lock me in a dark room, <laughs> which is kind of, which is true, uh, but also it's funny, but like Zvin is very accurate where he actually is very productive when he's by himself just with his, his desktop. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so. I actually, I know that sometimes when I start, I mean, I'm a, I have a, I've been a developer by trade for many years, mm -hmm. um, 
there'd be times when I have to set an alarm to make sure that I get up and walk around. Right, right. Right, just to get some exercise and get the blood moving. And you know how it is when you get on something and sometimes you need to walk away for five minutes to. Oh, yeah. You'll, yeah your brain will um, solve it. It's interesting now how there's, there's so many, you know, videos and blogs and articles about now about how to, how to keep a steady pace when you work from home and how to keep motivation up. You know, make sure you take breaks, you drink a lot of water, you, you, you know, you take the breaks that you probably usually would in a typical work day where, you know, you walk around the building or whatever it is, stretch and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's funny because, yeah, you know, I've been doing this for, and you've probably been doing this as well for, you know, a very long time. So it's kind of much ingrained in us in our everyday, where for me, it's, it's almost weird to actually, you know, have a cubicle and I know. have an actual physical desk, <laughs> not a coffee shop or you know, some random flat surface you can find in 24 hour fitness or something. <laughs> yeah, actually true. It's funny because I, I told you I, I live about three minutes from the San Francisco Bay. And, and when I work, you know, if I have a whole day where I'm working from home in the morning, once in the morning and once in the afternoon, I will walk down to the bay and back. Mm. And if I do that every day, I actually end up walking 150 miles a year. Wow. It doesn't seem huh. like it, but it adds up. Yeah, yeah. Wow, so, that's great. Huh. Yeah, and it, it does. It just gets you away for, it's a seven-minute walk there and back. <laughs> so, and it's a beautiful view, as you know. Yeah, no, definitely. So uh, so we talked about the pandemic a little bit. And what it did on, on March 16th in the Bay Area, everyone had to go remote. No choice. Um, you It sounds like your company was more than prepared for that. But did it, did it provide any roadblocks or challenges that you didn't expect? Yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of it was more... Kind of personal roadblocks um so, you know people you know you know probably you know they have much more things to worry about now than mm -hmm. they typically would in in their their typical work lives or even personal lives um you know instead of you know worrying about you know picking your kids up from school now you're worrying about you know standing in line at costco or buying mm -hmm. toilet paper <laughs> or new worries <laughs> so you know um things like you know not be able to get a haircut and things like that you know mm -hmm. it's um so i don't know if if um if the the load for people's personal lives either got worse or got, you know, got easier. But I feel like for a lot of our, our employees, at least, it, it, it definitely got a lot more heavy, um, mm -hmm. at least on, on that side. So I think it was definitely uh, one of the biggest challenges for us, which is being sure everyone is focused um, and also just kind of on the same page as like, yes, we want you to take care of your family. And I think every CEO <laughs> across the world is making sure that First and foremost, their employees are are, are in a good are, are in a good area or in a, in a good space, not only so that they can you know do work efficiently, but also just so that they're they're taken care of. And yeah, it's uh it's kind of um basically the same the same mindset as well as that you know if your employees are happy, they're most likely going to do good work. <laughs> yes, no, no one's going to you know be doing good work if ninety nine percent of their brain is thinking about their you know their personal hardships and things like that. So. It's, it's in their best interest as well and for the company to take care of that first. Yeah, so exactly. that's definitely uh, been one of the biggest challenges for us. Um, even if, you know, we, we've definitely been used to working remotely. I mean, we didn't have to send our employees laptops or things like that or anything like that or set up remote access or things like that as other companies probably would have. But that, that alone uh, definitely did take away a good, a good portion of our time. Yeah. And, and I noticed too, it, it's been harder for people to work from home who have small kids like you know two to five and then or people that had you know all of a sudden had to homeschool their kids yeah yeah the, juggle, um, the two yeah kind of like segue into like the education uh aspect of you know brad 3d and in the, in, in the pandemic environment now it's it's been interesting because we've been hearing a lot of feedback from you know from people that are in homeschooled and people that are you know trying to do a totally different experience where they're actually teaching you know medical education online mm -hmm. and a lot of people probably um, you know, there's probably, there's two different sides of it. There's one side of it being from the instructor side of things, people that are actually running the curriculum, um, and running the program. And the other flip side of things being people that are actually just kind of taking it in and mm -hmm. observing it. And from the people that have been teaching it, essentially running the curriculum, they, they're, a lot of them are, I think they're, they're totally fine. Mm -hmm. so they're like, oh yeah, I, you know, I'm going to put, I'm going to get HIPAA compliant zoom. Um, so I everything I say is secure as far as, you know, medical records go and things like that and private information. And I'm going to run my class um, just the way I typically would, mm -hmm. but just with Zoom. Um, yeah. And I'm going to treat it just like, just like as I'm lecturing. And I'm, I'm probably that, that mindset has been applied to other universities as well, as where like, hey, this is not a problem. I just 
turn on Zoom and I start my lecture and I pretend like I'm in, I'm in my lab, my, my lab or my, in my classroom. <laughs> yeah. But, but from the flip side of the thing where, you know, with, when you're observing it as a student or from the training clinician or whatever it may be, it's a totally different story <laughs> where you, you know, you find out that you're, you're needing new things where you didn't have before that, you know, you need either more engagement or you need more measurement tools or you need a different type of content whether it's you know some type, of, some type of online survey or online workshop that has more um, you know bit of online curriculum built into it, whether it's you know a simple like click yes or no thing or something that's more engaging, where mm -hmm. you would actually need to interact with the case itself, you know, some, through some type of problem solving exercise. Um, and there's really not a lot of data out there right now that that shows you know how effective these things are. I mean, we've um, you know we've had had we have a ton of tools out there now for you know big data and machine learning and things like that mm -hmm. we don't really have a lot of tools to collect the data um and be definitive that this is the standard way how we should run an online class or an online curriculum right. and i mean that brings up an interesting point because of your technology have you thought of applying that to other forms of learning yeah uh, i mean you know vr and ar uh has definitely wide applications for sure and you know just from a pure technology standpoint the core IP of Rad 3D is just to be able to take 3D data, uh, for example, medical scans, which would be conventional MRI, CD scan, and deliver that over the web to augmented reality devices. Mm -hmm. uh, as you, and you can kind of tell by the nature of that, that that can be applied to other industries. Uh, the main reason why we chose medical was because the, the majority of data uh, that's in 3D format is, is medical scans. Mm. Um, there's probably you know big portions of data in things uh, like agriculture or things like engineering and kind of like um, my CDO actually worked quite a bit in the scanning of oceans and things like that or collecting data of coral reefs and things like that as well. Hmm. Um, but the yeah, majority of 3D data out there right now is in medical imagery. Hmm. It makes sense. Interesting. So there's companies like Gaper that help develop and build um, systems for startups, startups like yourself. How important do you think this is going to be going forward for, for a CEO or a CIO that needs to hire, you know, specific skills and he needs to hire them in a hurry? Yeah, I think it's definitely going to be a game changer in short. I mean, um, like, well, kind of the point that we talked about earlier of it kind of being an, an unknown uh, skill that is just kind of popped up to people on, on their resumes now is that people are going to have to learn how to do uh, remote product, ma product management and project mm -hmm. management. Um, which probably is not on a lot of people's resumes today. <laughs> I mean, it's, first, it's definitely not on mine, but I could probably put that now because I'm like, yeah, I can, I can do that. <laughs> um, because I've been, that's what we've been doing uh, you know, for many, many years. Um, and I think right now, I mean, probably a lot of people who look at remote work, um, and maybe you can talk about this as well, a lot of them have, have been in, in small companies or in startups because right. remote work, it just, it just saves us money. So we just don't have... The, the funds to go hire five star you know job candidates um, and we can't compete with Google and the you know big companies for salary or for benefits for like so we just were forced to work remotely and hire these remote contractors because of the funds mm -hmm. um, but for bigger companies now who you know who definitely have the funds to hire people um, locally are probably you know looking at you know their the situation now and that, you know, their employees that are, you know, they're probably paying, you know, six figure salaries for um, easily in New York or in the Bay Area or in LA or things like that are, you know, they, they could probably, you know, they're probably realizing that, hey, like, I, I could probably get similar work for half the price. Um, yeah, and it really doesn't matter for me where, where they're based because I don't see them anyway. And right. but it's also the same story for the guy that's, you know, a couple miles down the road from me. I don't see him anyway either. Right. So what's really the benefit for me <laughs> of this person actually being lo local? Right. And the, the answer to that really is being, there's really not a lot. You're right. just, you know, paying tr double or triple or quadruple the cost for the same amount of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and to give you an idea, I mean, I, I look at this stuff, the average starting salary for a computer science grad from Stanford last year was 116 K. Wow. <laughs> and you'd need that to live in the Bay area. Oh, definitely. Yeah. But, you know, you don't need that to live, you know, like Salt Lake City, 74K. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the right US now, city. Yeah, go ahead. yeah, I mean, like, just to add on that, I mean, I'm, I'm in Hawaii right now, and, you know, a big part 
of what we're hearing now and locally is that it's actually been beneficial for the tech community here because a lot of the uh, remote development, I mean, I, I, actually a lot, of, a lot of my friends actually who work for bigger companies like Amazon and things like that, or, you know, kind of tech companies like that are working remote now. Mm -hmm. And before they would have to probably at least go through a, a pretty serious level of review in order to be approved to work yeah. from home. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or you have to be, you know, be in a certain position where your role, like it fits the work from home type of lifestyle right. yes. <laughs> where you don't see clients. So you, you know, you think that you're not in a sales role and things like that. Yeah. Um, but now, you know, you probably, yeah, it's, yeah, it's standard. You don't need to, go, need to go through that rigorous process of proving that you can work from home <laughs> or yeah. that, you know, you can deliver results um, from a working from home environment. So, and, and, you know, Hawaii, you know, and also the Bay Area as well, you know, being beautiful, beautiful place to live um, as a remote worker, you know, yeah, of course you would, you would love to have the benefit, you know, taking seven minute walks to the Bay or for us, you know, you know, walks to, you know, along the beach and things like that, or viewing things up in the mountains and stuff like that. So, yeah. uh, and that's just personally as, you know, even, even developers who spend a lot, a lot of time in dark rooms need, need some fresh air at some point. <laughs> So, yeah, I think there's, I mean, there's definitely ecosystems, tech ecosystems now that are probably, you know, not as big and robust as Silicon Valley is, or not as big as New York and LA is, but have, you know, the, the talent uh, yeah. to offer exceptional engineering services and things like that, but don't want to move to the Bay Area or just, you know, can't afford it, <laughs> which is probably a more likely case being cost of living nowadays. Yes. Um, so I definitely think it opens up opportunities for these freelancers and these remote workers to kind of up their, up their offering. Yes. Well, I mean, to give you a good example of that, um, I know this for a fact, my daughter's uh, a Carnegie Mellon graduate in ComSci. Mm -hmm. She got her master's from Carnegie and she stayed in Pittsburgh, right? Yeah. You know, and it, you probably know Carnegie Mellon is a really, really good university for computers. Yeah, so, so yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely think it's a big opportunity for, yeah, those kind of like smaller tech ecosystems to kind of like level the playing field. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, uh, there's definitely other advantages in being in the Bay Area besides, you know, finding top talent, but that's definitely a big reason. I mean, if you talk to, you know, 10 founders, I'd say nine of them would say the reason why they moved a company to the Bay Area was because of the talent. Right. Uh, and that definitely levels the playing field now where people, you know, they, either they can't afford it or they, they just flat out don't want to move <laughs> and, they, and they like where they live and they're, you know, their family there and the community is there where they're not, you know, they can still have uh, access to great talent staying right where they are. Yeah, this is true. Well, Evan, this has been uh, very fascinating. I think you got a great little product there. No, I shouldn't say little. It's, it's an actual very uh, robust product. Um, I wish you luck and I want to thank you for uh, joining me today on this podcast. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Uh, thank you for having me. You're welcome. Have, have a great day. <laughs> you too. <laughs>